Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and what follows is an excerpted clip from one of my longer webinars. So what I've decided is that sometimes when people ask really interesting questions, I will pull out that particular part of a webinar and make it available to you as a short clip so that if you don't have time to watch a one-hour webinar, you can at least watch and listen to the brief exchanges that I usually have with people who attend my webinars. So here is one such clip from a recent webinar. I hope you enjoy it. How is a post-colonial point of view different than the average point of view of these topics? Very good question. Um, well, here is, let me gi give you like a, a traditional Eurocentric view of the novel. Right? So if you're just looking at it from a Eurocentric point of view, where the idea of America or Europe dominant groups in America is centered, then uh, you, you will see Africa as this. So you, it will be very easy for you to make a claim that, well, the novel is not really about Africans. It Africa is a backdrop where the story of disintegration of a European mind is told. Right. That's a Eurocentric view of looking at it. Now, the post-colonial view is, why is Africa the place where a European mind goes to disintegrate? Are you telling us that Africa as a place is such a place that civilized people will become uncivilized automatically? Does the place do that too? Why does Africa have to be a backdrop? Why can't it be the center of its own story? All of these are post-colonial perspectives. It's just like saying, um, I'm, I'm writing a novel about India, but it's about you know, how Europeans live their lives in India. And you, you're like, well, there are like 500 million Indians, right? How can you write a novel only about Europeans and not account for those Indians with whom they are living. So the question is about representation, right? How is Africa represented? What are the connotations of that representation? And what are the consequences of it? So what the post-colonial scholars then do is question the very representation of these spaces and the people there, right? What kind of stereotypes are mobilized? And don't even go to Africa here. Right? If you're a woman reader or if you're a feminist scholar, you can pick up any book or watch any show and say, OK, why are women in this show presented as subservient and as less confident and as not strong in their opinions? What kind of an impact? Does, so that means you're looking at it from the point of view of a feminist and, and, and looking at the implications of what it will do for young girls, right? Postcolonialism does the same, right? We question the representation and its Eurocentricity. If you are going to tell a story in any of the colonial lands, what we will then challenge is the purely European way of looking at it. And then there are different gradations of it. There are still scholars who look at these novels from a very Eurocentric perspective. I would say they are majority. The, the, on Conrad, those scholars are still a majority. We just, we post-colonialists just come and, you know, sometimes throw a wrench in their works. The, that Eurocentric view already presupposes, and you'll see references to the, in the novel as well, uh, of Africa being, prehistoric. So what happens is another thing that is deeply Eurocentric and Americocentric is that people who uh, are invested in this mode of life always imagine that this is the present of the world and rest of the world is marching on to catch on to this present. What they don't try to figure out is that there are different temporalities in the world. The same people they're considering less developed in so many ways are more highly developed. Their family structures, right? The way they use technology, right? So the differences sometimes are just infrastructure. Sometimes, but that is the general idea 
be it the European researcher or the European writer, while interacting with the natives at the same time, puts his or herself in the present and places people they're interviewing and talking to in, in a past. That is called the allochronic discourse. And what Johannes Fabian, whose term it is allochronic discourse, encourages is what he calls coeval anthropology. Coeval meaning in which both of them exist in the same time, right? And we try to understand this other culture within the present and not looking at it as if it exists in the past colonial practices yes absolutely uh, the the neo colonial practices can be economic right uh, okay so the biggest neo colonial practice at this time is is the global debt right so most of the debts that are issued by imf these were issued in 1973 right and by and large every developing country if you look at their budget the first thing that they have to set aside is to pay the interest on that debt so pretty much almost all the developing nations are in a debt trap they are literally serving the developed nations by paying these interests so that's one form of neocolonialism other forms of neocolonialisms are are the trade rules you know they are decided by what World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization is a non-democratic organization because your votes are weighted depending on your GDP. So that means the global trade policy can never be decided by the developing nations. It will always be decided by the power of the dominant groups, right? And hence will always be in favor of the dominant nations. These are some forms of neocolonialism. And then culturally, think of it this way. If you look at India, Singapore, all these nations, if they want to develop, what are they trying to develop? To become service spaces, right? So to train their people to become part of the global market, but what is their role in that? I'm gonna work at a call center. I'm gonna become a programmer, right? But if you're a programmer, you know, sitting somewhere in Ahmedabad, doing the same work with a programmer is doing in Silicon Valley. And you, if you're equally as competent, you still won't make that much money. Those global inequalities are part of the neo-colonial regime, right? 64% uh, of the profits that come, that are made in the world still travel back to the North Atlantic region, okay? All these corporations, other things. I mean, look at this phone right? It's a $900 phone, right? Its total cost in materials and labor in China is less than $70, right? So we can build these things in these other parts of the world where labor is kept cheap, right? And then we can sell them for a huge, what is it, like 700% profit, right? All of these in one way or the other, are the neo-colonial or neo-imperial strategies, right? Uh, policies. So the world, even though people will say it's equal, it's still not equal, right? And 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 the established economies, uh, maybe now China and Japan are a part of it to uh, have a definite advantage. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this brief clip. If you are interested in the longer version, the link will be in the description and you can watch the whole webinar. Thank you so much for your support. And as always, if you have any questions, any concerns, you can always post them in the comments and I'll be happy to respond to them. If you have a moment and if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so now so that you get timely notifications of whatever is happening on this channel. Thank you for your support. Stay safe and as always, from me to you, peace and love.